You know, man has never proved that he could govern himself. You think about this. Man cannot live without restraints. And we know even when he is restrained and has some restraints, he sometimes runs amok. And that's why we have stop signs. That's why we have traffic lights. That's why we have those in authority. Why? To govern us. Because without that, we run amok. It's just the way human nature is. And so we are capable of some of the worst possible things that you could even imagine. We won't go into them in detail, but all you have to do is read your paper. All you have to do is watch the news. And some of the most egregious, heinous, malicious things happening around us all the time. And we've become almost insensitive to it because we see it all the time. And it's just something about, I'll never forget when I was in business for myself many, many years ago and I was in California. And in my business, there was a company that I dealt with and they provided me with signs, very nice, colorful signs. And uh, you would hang them up and they would pretty much promote to their product that we handled in our business. And so I'll never forget this one person tell me, he says, now you have to understand about these signs. If you leave that sign in the same place for too long, people won't see it anymore, even though it's there. He said, once in a while, take that sign and move it and put it somewhere else. And it's almost what human nature is. We become desensitized. I don't care how often you've heard the gospel. You know, in these days, the gospel is so minimized in its, in its impact because we're so afraid of stepping on people's toes and so afraid that it's not going to be popular or we're not going to be politically correct. But that's why God has given us the restraints, because he knows we cannot govern ourselves. Now, there are three major, you can follow me now in my notes, there are three major influential, authoritative forces in the earth that restrain, restrain as I'm talking about being restrained, restrain the deleterious effect of evil and keep society from disintegrated. There's just three major forces. And each of them have a very important role to play. And so when you think of, well, first we have governments. We know the government has a certain amount of control. They have certain rules, regulations. And if you go beyond those bounds, yeah, we're free. But if we go beyond our freedom, intrude on someone else's freedom, then we can get in trouble with the government. So we have governments. We have the church. The church is a tremendous restraining power of evil. You say, well, I don't know. Everything I look around, I see evil everywhere. Just imagine what it would be if the church wasn't here. Imagine what it would be if there was no preaching of the gospel, if there was no, if there was no barometer of how I should live my life. And then thirdly, the Holy Spirit. So we know there are three main forces. Now, if you've if you're observant, and I'm not trying to just remind you of the negatives of life, but I don't want you to become so desensitized that you say, well, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, when it's not okay. Now, governments can be affected by evil. We've seen in our own lifetime those in, of the hierarchy of our country who could believe one thing at some point in their life and then at another point in their life, change their mind. We've heard this term, I've evolved. I came in as a part of the hierarchy, and I believe that one man for one woman constitutes a marriage. But now I've evolved. So now I believe that if two men, two women, if love each other, then I suppose if that's, if that's the criteria, I want you to think about that for a minute. If the criteria is simply that I feel I love someone and therefore I should be able to marry them. Well, if that's the case, then why shouldn't a grown adult be able to marry a little child? If they love them and they feel that that's what they want to do, you say, that's ludicrous. Yeah, it wasn't too long ago. It was ludicrous to think of two men, two women. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about desensitize. Suddenly we begin to accept it. Now you're hearing it throughout. So not only do you see it being accepted, but then it becomes heralded. It becomes celebrated. When the White House itself can have the five colors that de depict of all the different 
styles of living. I don't even go into it right today. So governments can be affected negatively by evil. And so we can't trust governments totally to do the total job that needs to be done. And the church is the last bastion that we have presently in this, this particular time frame in, in history. This is the grace dispensation. The church is the most formidable moral facility that God has to use for his glory and honor to restrain evil. And even the church has been affected by evil. And so little by little, we have lost track of what we used to take for granted in the Bible. We heard it every Sunday. We heard it all the time. Ministers were not afraid of losing their congregation. They weren't afraid of losing their job or losing this or that or prestige in their, in their community because they're, they're trying to stick to preaching the word. So we have major denominations today that have left the true teaching of the word of God. And they have heralded and celebrated the same sin that I just mentioned about from our government. So you can see the dilemma that the world is in. If there's no barometer, if there is no light to shine, if there's no direction, it's proven that man cannot live right without restraint. And that's why when we come to Christ, we have things that God builds into us through conviction of the Holy Spirit. We're not forced. We're never coerced. But God builds into us a moral quality, a, a morality that only he can really put inside you to make you want to live right. Not you have to live right. You want to live right. You want to do right. You want to see good things happen in the society. You don't want to see it to deteriorate like every other empire has in all throughout history. There have been some great times. You could just look through the dispensational ages if you just looked at it. And you look at the different times in history and how great empires would rise and fall. And almost always it would rise in glory and fall in disrepute because of sin. Because man could not control himself without God. And of course the Old Testament spends a lot of time Boy, you read Jeremiah and Ezekiel, read through there. I mean, they make you shudder. God just was so irritated. He was so chagrined by the sin. The people would, would stop following him. They'd start, they'd start building idols and places of worship and even sacrifice their children. God would become incensed. If you think God doesn't have a temper, you just haven't read the Old Testament. <laughs> And don't want to mess with Mr. God. I can tell you. I mean, and then poor Jeremiah and poor Ezekiel, and they're out there as the prophets of God. And he said, hey, son of man, you go over and you tell them this. You tell them what I'm going to do. I'm going to fry them in oil. Well, he didn't say that, but <laughs> same thing. He said, I'm going to really, I'm going to come on the scene, and this is going to happen. And, all, and he tells them, <laughs> Poor prophets, they have to go and tell the people. Do you think the people want to hear the truth? They stone the poor prophet. He's trying to do God's will, trying to be a spokesman for God. It's almost like that today, I'll tell you for sure. Not easy to stand true to the Word of God today. It's easier to facilitate the day you live in. You know, flow. You know, I say, go with the flow, Brother Dave. You know, they think that's hip. Different strokes for different folks, Brother Dave. Yeah, tell me about it. How come the strokes are always in the wrong direction? So I'm just mentioning to you that these three forces are in the world to restrain evil. So I said to the chagrin of governments are capable of being influenced by evil. As a result, positive leadership is compromised. People are human beings. They're able to be compromised. You know, they're not set in stone. I mean, unless your faith is anchored in Christ, you'll waver all over the place. There'll be no solidity in your life. Only Christ can solidify a life because we're whimsical. We can't help it physically. We're just, in our emotionally, we're just, we can just drift to and fro. The Bible says it's like the wind. We just, like a willow tree in a windstorm. We just blow with it. And it's very difficult to handle it. But I want to tell you this. 
God has a connection with the church, and he still has a faithful church. Amen. With all that has happened with not only major denominations, but let's face it, that's happened in evangelical circles as well, just not as profound in the direction that I was referring to earlier. But in other moral issues, there certainly has, has plagued the evangelical church as well. But the church innately maintains the greatest potential for good and as a result of her supernatural connection with the Holy Spirit. And when the church is galvanized to and in tune with God's plan, nothing can interdict what the church can do. Your grandparents, your great-grandparents, you could go down through history. When people, were, when revival was in force around the world, or around the country for sure, as we know it in history, you saw changes in the country. You saw morality become number one again instead of immorality. So what impresses me that God tells the church, and we just read it in our opening remarks in uh, Matthew chapter 16. He says, Peter, you just confess that I'm the son of God. You didn't think this up on your own, Peter. My father has given you this revelation. That's a revelation that Jesus Christ is not just a carpenter's son. He's not just another human being. He's the son of the living God. And he looks at you and I who represent the church and he said, let me tell you something. The gate, this is Jesus. He says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. I don't know if you can understand the, the momentum of that, such a statement as that. There is nothing, ladies and gentlemen, in your life, there is nothing that can come against you that God cannot defeat. There is nothing that can overcome you if God says no. Put your faith in him. He says the gates of hell, no matter what it can master, whatever it can mix up and put together, cannot prevail against you. Well, that means if it can't prevail against you, then the gates of hell shall not prevail. So it can't even hold its ground. You can push them back. Push them back. We ought to have a little song about that. We've been doing it for 52 years. I wish I knew how many miles we pushed the devil back. Push him back. Dave, Brother Dave, push him back. Congregation, push him back. Mine. Push him back. Push him back. Push him back now. Push him back then. Push him back now. Push him in the future. <laughs> I, I just got a call from Beyonce. They want me to do a rap. No, I don't. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy on my soul. But that really does touch me. I mean, the gates of hell, imagine that. The worst the devil can put together cannot prevail against you. It's such an exhilarating, exciting period in history. People all the time say, I wish I lived in the days of the apostles, prophets. No, I wish I lived right now. This is the greatest opportunity to do something for God ever in the history of the world. I don't believe anybody's ever had more of a challenge than the church today. The church has the greatest challenge it's ever had in its whole existence, at least so far as we're concerned. Obviously, each generation feels the same about their situation. Maybe the Roaring Twenties felt that it was impossible. Then people would never come back to the Lord to live so full, you know, free and fancy-footed with uh, immorality and so on. We could say that, you know, immediately during the war when, when men had to go to war and they said that Sally the Riveter went to work in the shops and so on. You know, remember, there was a whole thing began to happen. Morality began to break down because of and so on. We always have excuse. Then they came back from the war. Then they, they, they were traumatized. And so, you know, and this goes on and on. There's always a reason. And the 60s come and they're burning down cities. And then the 70s come and then the hippies come. And, you know, there's always a reason. But I know God doesn't ever get old, and he never loses his power, and his word never changes. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what the church needs to be doing, what I mentioned to you the other Sunday, that we need to be celebrating what God has already done. We don't have to get in a corner or beg God, oh God, please, God, please. What do you mean, please? He's already done what he said he would do. Why don't we do what we're supposed to do? 
Why don't we have some faith? Why don't we get some gumption and say, God, you said it. You did it. You paid the price. It's already done. You already won the battle. I was telling the other sermon, whenever it was, when I was talking about this, and I was thinking about the Roman Empire, which was very powerful one time in their existence, and they had a very powerful army, they had very powerful generals. And when they were attacked or someone where was some menace for whatever it was or for whatever reason, they would go and defeat, and they would do it with overpowering or an overwhelming force. Whoever the enemy was, they would totally beat them to pulp, so to speak. And then they didn't settle for that. They won the victory on the battlefield. They won it. But then why did they put people in the stands by the thousands that were regular residents of Rome? Why was it then, since the battle was already won, why was it that then they brought the general who won the battle in the chariot and he came going by just like it was a Hall of Fame parade? or the Orange Bowl Parade, or, or, or whatever the one is in, in the little town outside by California, no, Pasadena, you know what I mean. Now, like Californians, do not be. I realize it's a nice, beautiful city, Pasadena. I've been there. I really did that. Sister Merlene and I went because it was going to be the big parade. We missed the big parade, but we got to see almost the parade. There was a, well, it was almost a parade. After their parade was over, they would, they had a big area where they brought all these floats and stuff. You know how elaborate they are. They brought them in the big area. And we got to go to that area and look at all these floats. And we watched the parade right there in that little. <laughs> but it was great like that. And people assembled and they were there. And so the general would go. And behind him was the, the minions of, and, the, and the battalion of soldiers that had won the battle. And they were all there proud, dressed in all array. And they were marching in victory because they were celebrating. And what were they celebrating? The defeat of their enemy. Who are the, who, who, where were the enemy? They were walking behind them on chains, naked being embarrassed before the human beings that were watching because they were the defeated foe. And that's the way I think of the devil. You un, you unclothed, you foul. Never mind. I just have my own way. <laughs> you can insult him in your own way. Some of you don't have the nerve. You're so afraid if you insult him, he's going to beat you up. But I know somebody. Yeah, yeah, I know somebody. Yeah, he's tough. But you ever have in school, you always had somebody who was tough, but there's always somebody tougher. Well, I know somebody tougher. I know somebody bigger. I know somebody is looking out for me. And I'm not afraid of that devil because I know who, who his victor is. Hey, you know, in the natural world, I don't know if you, you, you dig this, but you ever hear the term, who's your daddy now? <laughs> Come on. Now, you know, I never forget when Pedro, Pedro Ramos, I forget, he, I, know he, I think he pitched for, uh, I think he used to pitch for Boston, then he went to pitch for, for, Cle for New York, and when he came into the Boston Stadium to pitch against Boston, where he used to be, they said, and they started hitting him, they said, who's your daddy now, Pedro? <laughs> and that's what I tell the devil. See, he's a fake. He's a liar. He acts like he has the goods, and he doesn't have the goods. He has the phony baloney front. He's got a veneer, but I know somebody that can tear that veneer down. And he's already won the battle. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Love this. Now thanks be to God, who once in a great while, when he doesn't get too tired, once in a while, no, thanks be to God, who all, let's say it together, always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. He's already done what he said he would do. I have to take you to Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, another favorite verse of mine. I have a lot of favorite verses. Last time I looked, I think it was 1,268 favorite verses. Listen, this is past. It doesn't say, hey, I want you to work together with me. We're going to fight the devil. No, he says, having, 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 past tense. Having disarmed principalities, and powers, he made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them in it. Yeah. It's already done, folks. Yeah. Why do we sit back and fret and worry and 
don't know which way to turn and let ourselves get under the load and feel like we're hopeless and everything else. Don't you realize you're on the winning side? We're winners. I said we're winners. We're hooked up with a winner. We live with a winner. A winner lives inside of us, and we're going to live with that winner throughout all of eternity. Why don't we give him the thanks and the praise he deserves? You see, our praise, ladies and gentlemen, makes us a part of the celebration. That's what you do when you clap your hands and you, if you go to a game and they do a touchdown or they hit a home run at the seventh inning with two men out. I mean, you know. <laughs> Help us, Jesus. Help us not to become secular, Lord, or worldly. You know what I mean. The Lord said, what are you talking about? I was watching that game myself. No, no. <laughs> Come on, stick with Brother Dave. Don't get mad. Just a little thing I say right away you want to bail out. Stick with me. We're not fighting the battle. When we praise, we're praising God that the battle's already been fought and it's already been won and I'm the recipient of the benefits of the battle that's been won by Jesus Christ, the Son of the Lord living God, who never loses. You have to learn to lose once in a while. No, I serve somebody that he don't know what losing means. Hallelujah. All right, you can teach your children that. I understand. Psalm 106, verse 47. Save us, O Lord, our God, and gather us from among the Gentiles to do what? To give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. What more do we need, folks? Hebrews says it's the offer of sacrifice. Let us offer the sacrifice of praise unto God continually. And if we don't know what that means, he said it's the fruit of your lips giving thanks unto the Lord. Yeah. Acting like you believe that the battle's already been won. Whew, I don't know if it's going to make me popular or they're going to run me out one thing. or Stones, they may bring stones. After all, Brother Dave, they stoned them in the Old Testament. If you keep this up, we're going to stone you. Oh, God, you soft stones. Hey, throw, uh, let me see what you can say. You know the little, little jelly things? And they're not jelly, but they, they look like that, you know, the orange slices and stuff. You know, I use two of them in your teeth, and they get real sticky in your mouth. You can't get it out. When you... Well, those things, throw them at me. No stones, please. Put a sign up there, Brother Terry, just by the door and say, no stones allowed in the church. I don't trust everybody. I trust most of our people, but it's 10% of the people. <laughs> Help us, Lord Jesus. I'm trying to do the best I can. Revelation. Now watch this. This is an interesting point. Revelation comes through praise. Look at Psalm 49.4. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will disclose my dark saying on the harp. Is that any wonder that God puts emphasis, at least through me in this church, I believe he puts it in the scripture in, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, where he said, I will sing with the understanding, I'll sing in the spirit. Look what happens when David did it. Things that he didn't know, nuances. Listen, we, we can study the Bible and think we know it. But those of us who have studied the Bible and read the Bible and preached from the Bible for years and years and years still can read the Bible and find truth nestled somewhere in a scripture we may have read a hundred or even a thousand times and yet sometime there's a nuance we missed and it can bless us again that's the exponent exponential power of the word of god it you never get to, it's not just like reading a classic book you read it if you read it 10 times you know you wouldn't read it again you you would find it boring but the bible never boring because it's alive and by the way, let me just tell you a little bit. So those of you that don't understand about heaven and you don't understand how we're going to have such a good time in heaven every day, you say, won't we eventually get used to it and then get a little bit tired of it? No. You know why? Because God is so great. We can't know him perfectly in one day because it'll take day after day after day. And each day will be another exciting thing, another exciting thing about God, another exciting thing about him. On and on throughout all of eternity with joy, unspeakable and full of glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. World without end. There's something about the act of praise that opens our heart to the reception of the revelation from God. 
prays, prepares you to understand the subtle meanings of God's word. It prepares you to receive the rhema. See, people don't understand. You can have a great big family Bible in your house sitting on, your, on one of the end tables or somewhere. You know, every once in a while you have to dust it off because it's never used. It's just there. It looks real nice. It's probably white and has maybe the picture of Jesus on the front of it. Oh, it's holy. Oh, it's such a holy book, but you never read it. See, that's the logos of God, whether you like it or not. Some say, some say logos, logos, or logos, L-O-G-O-S, whatever it is. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's the Word of God. But until you read it and it becomes applicable to your life, that's the rhema. That's when it applies to you personally. And that's what you find when you read the Bible. And that's when it opens up to you because you're praising the Lord. What do you do when you praise Him? You're making a confession that Jesus is who he said he is. He's worthy of your praise because of what? Because he went to the cross and died on the cross for you and me, shed his precious blood for the remission of our sins so that we wouldn't have to pay for our sins. He already paid the debt. <clears throat> and we can believe him with all our heart and trust him that even though we're imperfect in the natural, don't kid yourself, you'll never be perfect in this life in the natural. There will always be some area of your life. That's why I disdain people that say that the Lord's Prayer doesn't, uh, doesn't pertain to us today. Well, you old self-righteous, you go ahead then. Say, I don't have to pray and ask God to forgive me. He's already forgiven me. Let me tell you something. If you're committing, you know, everybody does, some way or another, you're either, either committing a sin of commission, you actually know what you're doing, or you're committing a sin of omission, something you should have did and you didn't do. Someone needed your time, you wouldn't give it to them. Somebody needed to help, a little finance there, you wouldn't give it to them that moment because you were too busy, you had other things in mind. What do you think that is? That's a sin of omission, something you should have done, you didn't do. How do we handle And the Bible says, if a man say he's not sinned, he's a liar. But if we confess our sin, if, if, that's conditional, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and all unrighteousness. And that's how we live day by day. We should never go to bed without saying, Lord, if I did something today, even though I didn't even know what it was, that didn't please you, please forgive me. Help me not to miss it the next time. Well, I didn't think you'd be real happy about that. You'd probably rather hear that one guy Looks good. Not from our country. Letting you know that you don't have to pray no more. Ask God to forgive. He's already done forgiving. Well, go ahead and try that. But I wouldn't want to be with you when you have to stand before God. There's going to be a day we're going to stand before God for our actions. And if, we've take, if we make license out of the Bible, then we've prostituted the Bible. You know, if we just feel like it justifies our sin, then we, we really got a serious problem. Oh, the Lord's saying, go ahead, Brother Dave, preach here and listen. Preach it, Brother Dave. Can't you hear? <laughs> and then another scripture says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And that is, again, it's rhema that proceeds from the mouth of God. Praise prepares us for miracles. When the devil comes in against us, praise will always maneuver away out of the problem. Psalms 15, 23, can we get that in? Whoever offers praise glorifies me, he says. And to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. Aren't you appreciative of that? The word salvation in the Old and New Testament impacts body, soul, and spirit. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. I'm hurrying because I got a little bit more to get in here. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. This shows the three parts you are. Spirit may sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, whole soul, and whole body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful how the Lord loves us and cares about us? When we offer praise to God, we should look for a demonstration of his salvation and deliverance. When we praise God, we prepare the way for him to intervene in our lives. You may feel that you, you know, I've had people tell me, this, you don't understand, Brother Dave. I don't know. I must, I must look like a dupus or something. Said, you don't understand. Well, I don't know if that, if that fits. You don't look it up. I don't remember now what that word means. But <laughs> it didn't sound right to me. But anyhow, the devil may make you feel that you're the fool. 
And then, you know, we're supposed to be a fool. We're supposed to follow him. He's got like a, a chain in our mouth and just carrying us around. We've got to be able to stand up for ourselves. Say, devil, you're trespassing on private property. You don't understand, devil. You don't, I know you're the God of this world, devil, but I'm not of this world. <laughs> Hallelujah. I belong to another world. My citizenship is another world. I'm just temporarily walking on earth. You may be the God of this world, but you're not the God of my life. The God of my life is the one who went to the cross, died the death that no one else could die. He died in my stead. And thank God Almighty, I'm not what I used to be. I'm somebody because I'm packed up, ready to go up, because I'm I'm hooked up with the Son of the living God. Why don't you give him a praise and a thanks?